This is the Physical Activity Researcher Podcast, a podcast for researchers of sedentary behavior, physical activity, and sports. Join for a relaxed dialogue about research design, practicalities, and, well, anything related to research. Learn from your fellow researchers useful and relevant information that does not fit into formal content and limited space of scientific publications. And here is your host. Welcome, everyone. This is the Meaningful Sport Podcast, and I am your host, Nora Ronkainen. Meaningful Sport is a series of discussions on the why and how involvement in sport and physical activity can be an important part of a life worth living. If you are interested in the theme, you might also want to check out MeaningfulSport.com. There you can find podcast show notes, read a blog, and access many resources for further explorations of Meaningful Sport. Today's episode is the second part of our discussion with Professor Simon Beams on outdoor education, recreation, and adventure. In the first part of the episode, which I recommend you to check out, we discussed the search of interest in nature-based recreation following the COVID pandemic, but also the broader trends and some of the romantic ideas about how going back to the nature might or might not be part of the answers to some of the big pressing questions we are facing collectively. In this episode, we will move on and focus our discussion explicitly on outdoor education. Together with Mike Brown, Simon has written a book titled Adventurous Learning, a Pedagogy for a Changing World, which forms the basis for our conversation today. We explore both the theory and practice of adventurous learning and finish up with some philosophical remarks on the potential role of adventure and outdoor activities in living a good life. Simon Beams is a professor of outdoor studies at the Norwegian School of Sports Sciences. Before his uh, joining the NE Hall about a year ago, he was at the University of Edinburgh for almost 15 years and still retains a point two position there. Simon is interested in understanding the role of outdoor activities or free lift sleeve in addressing the big questions of our societies, sustainability, health and well-being, and diversity and equality issues. He has published five books, including Adventurous Learning, which we discussed today, and Adventure and Society. I hope you enjoy the episode as much as I enjoyed my discussion with Simon. Let's move our discussion now more explicitly to an educational context. And you have been grappling with this concept of adventure for quite some years already, and and you've written about adventurous learning. So let's talk about that concept that you have developed and why you think it's a meaningful concept for education and how does it help to address some of the big challenges in our times for for educators i had three questions but pick whichever you want okay yeah i'll uh (laughs) i'll I'll give it a go yeah so i think i mean my original uh love or my original work has always been in education but more latterly what i've came to realize is that you know what is is that all education takes place within societal structures, uh, and so uh, it, it and it is it's, it's full of humans, of course. So that that's uh, so I th- social theory and these broader looks, uh, broader perspectives from society, I think, are important when we're working in education because our education takes place within our educational enterprises. Let's say take place within those grander. Uh, societal structures that are full of norms about how people uh, act um, towards each other and so on. So that's kind of a starting point. So Adventurous Learning is uh, a book uh, that I co-wrote with Mike Brown, uh, who's in New Zealand. And our, it, it, it started, uh, we were having discussions sort of three, four years before the before we wrote the book about what we saw as this trend in outdoor adventure education, which was towards a much more predictable, standardized, kind of packaged 
provision. And we were talking about this about 15, 20 minutes ago, right? When we're talking about this whole McDonaldization of adventure. And so then we started looking into the Disneyization of adventure, which is uh, how, how adventure, we, th- we argued, was being increasingly uh, re- taking on some of the features of, of, of theme parks uh, where there would be um, uh, increasingly people might be dressing a certain way to create a certain ambiance there'd be uh there'd be maybe products for sale there would be uh yeah so so it would it became more and more of a show if you like mm-hmm. um um so we were seeing these these trends happening in the world of outdoor adventure but they really seemed to be mimicking or following up right along with what was going on in mainstream education and that is uh that the scope for teachers to decide what students were going to study and how they were going to study was being increasingly narrowed. Mm. Uh, student uh, competence was being um, increasingly assessed uh, by standardized uh, examinations. Uh, so the and therefore. Too much of the teaching was then being driven by being able to pass the exam, and so so the the, the exam starts being the the tail that wags the dog in education. So what what we saw was, hang on a second, outdoor adventure is going just the same way as mainstream education. But what we thought was crazy was that a lot of outdoor adventure education came to the came to the fore, came to the, the, uh, became more popular because it was an alternative to mainstream education, but it was becoming just as packaged and predictable as, as we saw a mainstream education becoming. Mm-hmm. At the same time as all this is happening, was happening, we, you know, we, all we needed to do was look around us at the trends that were happening in society where Increasingly, the world was becoming more and more uncertain, in, right? In terms of, well, what, am I going to have a, a job for my whole life, or am I going to switch jobs a lot? Am I going to have a pension when I get older? Um, it, am I safe? You know, this is, you know, think back to the the, the first decade of the of the millennium, all with all these uh, horrific. Uh, uh, acts of terrorism that were being shown live on television, live on television, mm-hmm. uh, uh, and then the, the financial crash. That so the, uh, in I think it was two thousand eight. So we have young people growing up thinking, "Oh my goodness, I'm just not sure about this world that I'm growing up in," uh, and uh, and you're being bombarded by media that's uh, that's saying, "Hey, this is." that's sort of just being blitzed by these messages surrounding uncertainty. Uh, so where am I going with this? To the, the rationale behind the book, where, where we were seeing outdoor adventure and mainstream adventure becoming increasingly prescribed and packaged, where on the other hand, life was becoming increasingly uncertain, uh, unpredictable, moving more and more quickly, and feeling quite scary actually so it seemed to us that we that uh, what educational programs needed to be doing was to be helping prepare students to thrive in environments that were uncertain and i think the follow up question then would be that how does adventurous learning how does it help young people to do that Right. Well, what we did is we we found that the term adventure was incredibly vague uh, because everything becomes an adventure. As we were saying earlier on, oh wow, well, you know, I went to the went down to get some milk today at the store. Whew, what an adventure I had! The uh, you know the uh, there was construction on the road and I had to take a detour and uh, that was crazy. Uh, but uh, so so we thought that adventure was too broad a term, so we broke it down into four different dimensions or four concepts and each of these lies on a dimension of say a lot of it and not a lot of it so the four dimensions are uncertainty authenticity agency and mastery should i take you briefly through each one of those or 
Yeah, let's let's take a look at each one of them, and then we can have a bit broader discussion on that. Okay. So the the first one here is uncertainty, as we talked a little bit about. Is that, so the idea here is that educational programs need to have some uncertainty built into them, so that they can help students thrive in conditions that are uncertain. And in fact, um, uh, Rebecca Towers did her PhD uh, looking at uncertainty competences, which was kind of related to that uh, that she did that at Edinburgh. And so how can we build some uncertainty, uncertainty of outcome and uncer uncertainty of process in particular? Hopefully outcome is maybe a little less uncertain in terms of we want to learn a given uh, piece of knowledge, but uh, how we get there may not be um, so prescribed. Mm -hmm. uh, authenticity refers to how... The, the level of um, the level of realness. Realness isn't the great word, but I think it, it it but it does capture what we're talking about here. So, in terms of is what is the degree of transfer that needs to happen between this educational endeavor and what's going to happen with the student after the experience? So, sometimes in outdoor education, the transfer is so huge. You know, like we're going to build a raft with barrels and planks and rope and paddle across this lake and it's going to be a really cool adventure activity well mm -hmm. we would say well you know so what what is that preparing you for is it we would describe that as a pretty inauthentic activity unless we are preparing people to uh, be castaways on a desert island right <laughs> so so why why aren't we why aren't we uh looking at challenges that exist uh, that, it, that like adventurous uh, challenges that exist within our communities like why can't we have a team building activity that involves helping a senior citizens home or that involves uh working uh, on a project with homeless people for example yeah. what, so it's mm. just like let's 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 focus on uh what's going on in our places what what's wrong with our uh, with uh, go, what's 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 wrong in, in in terms of things that are happening in our places and how we can work to address them together so that would be yeah. so so let's keep it keep it real keep it authentic that way mm -hmm. the third thing is agency and that's having the power to choose uh, to be to to be an agent to 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 have some uh, to have some autonomy in terms of uh, what is being learned and how it's being learned. So uh, and and this involves taking a lot of responsibility as well for for one's learning and responsibility for that the process of learning. The and the fourth thing is is mastery. So uh, looking at how people can really develop uh, much deeper levels of knowledge. Uh, stronger skills because without knowledge and skill uh, people can't make judgments right and so we want people to make good choices and decisions in their lives but they need uh, they need knowledge and skills to do that and too often what we were seeing in uh, outdoor adventure programs was uh, people going kids going away for a week and doing these taster sessions where they were getting exposed to so many different activities in a very kind of McDonaldized way, so you get you know two hours of orienteering, two hours of the high ropes course, two hours of kayaking, two hours of canoeing, and on and on yeah. and on and on. And it was happening in a very institutional way. Like you will eat, your group eats at twelve fifteen. You're finished at twelve thirty. After that, you move to this activity and that activity. Like just com super super regimented, you know. So yeah. uh, so how can people develop uh, a kind of a depth of mastery, uh, which will then enable them to make good decisions when they're on their own. Because at some point, if this is an educational program, we're not going to be with our students anymore. They're going to have to fly solo. And we need to give uh, equip people uh, with uh, the tools to fly solo, not just uh, to kind of glide, but to be able to really um, thrive in a world that is increasingly characterized by uh, mobility with these incredible communications, but with massive, massive uncertainty. And at a time like this, 
you know, with, with, with COVID, I mean, the uncertainty is just, uh, the uncertainty level, if you like, is just, is gone up uh, a couple of huge notches. I mean, it just must be a really scary time for young people. They're thinking, wow, what, what am I going to do with my life? What's my life going to look like in next year, 10 years from now, 20 years from now? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, being in education now, like just thinking of the present moment is that, you know, students are facing massive uncertainties, but also beyond COVID, we, we know that a lot of jobs that exist today are not going to be there in 10 years or 20 years. So there's going to be like a real life adventure that <laughs> that is the process of finding your way, your path in life and, and, and your employment as well. That's right. Yeah. And I think that's it, you know, that the real life adventure. So how can we prepare people for those real life adventures? And they're probably not through standardized testing and um, being, yeah, going, going through a, you know, a highly prescriptive educational program, if you like. We, we mm -hmm. need to be, uh, pe people need to be able to uh, work, address challenges that they've never come across before. And they need to be able to do these as the challenges are actually shifting while they're working on them. <laughs> you know, this whole business of it, like nothing is standing still anymore. You know, as uh, as uh, Bauman said, you know, these these are the, 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 these times are liquid. They're they're always moving. So just as soon as we think, oh, I I need, I'm, I'm getting to grips with this. Well, it it's, it's probably too late if you're getting to grips with it because things things are continuing to to move. And so it's being able to to uh, to, to respond really quickly uh, as uh, uh, the challenges before us are are moving and evolving that that's to me that that's going to be those are the kinds of uh, challenges we have as educators because we're we're trying to educate uh, young people for a world that uh, no one can predict what it's like and where in many ways with a lot of the stuff that we're using whether it's uh, these different technologies and so on they're much better equipped to use them than than many of us you know so yeah. it's, fa it's fascinating times to be to to be in education that's for sure and i i'd love to uh, read a book 20 years from now about uh, how somebody doing a really good uh, kind of historical look at, at, at how it all shifted sort of from the age of the, uh, from the introduction of the, the internet in 1995 to when smart devices and touchscreen devices came along roughly 15 years later to then, mm. and then this uh, shift, uh, this, you know, huge so wholesale shift to, uh, to online learning or at least blended learning. And so it's just, just amazing these shifts that have happened. Yeah. I, I would be very curious to ask about this uncertainty element, like we already talked about, if we think of adventure tourism, actually things are very much packaged, pre-packaged for you, so you pretty much know exactly what is going to happen. And of course, there is always this um, big questions about health and safety, and, and you certainly don't want anyone to uh, experience harm in in their adventures and especially in the education context. So if you are working with, with your, your elements and, and you are designing something for kind of practical uh, things that you do with students, how do you work with uncertainty? What can it look like, for example? Yeah, so the way I work with it is I generally make my, if I'm working outdoors in particular, is my adventures are a lot less sexy than they used to be. Uh -huh. And what I mean by that is they tend to be much closer to home, yeah. uh, require less in terms of technical skill, and require they, re they require less in terms of um, technical equipment. Yeah. And there is probably, well, in some ways, there's probably a greater likelihood of them feeling some somewhat uncomfortable due to things not going according to plan but when that does happen it is not going to have any kind of severity that could 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 be that could harm them so what i what i mean by that so is instead of saying right well we're going to go on a journey and it's going to be first we're going to take a 
uh, a bus into the mountains five hours from here, and then we're going to do X and Y things and journey. Um, well, I think we could have, uh, the, in order to go on that journey, or if we're going to be on a river or going to be uh, in, in doing a, a winter ski tour, there's a need for those people in charge. To, or the, the sexy of the activity becomes the, the greater control the, the leader or the facilitator has to exert, right? So yeah. things become, have to become more and more predictable, more and more regulated. But mm -hmm. if we say, right, we're just gonna, we're gonna start from here uh, on campus and we're gonna, and we've decided, my group, the group has decided where they wanna go. And uh, it won't be just a hike because they want to uh, go hiking for the sake of it. We want to, it'll be, if it's me organizing this adventurously, I would, I would ask them to choose a spot that they wanted to visit and, have, and choose it because they, they wanted to find out something about that place. Mm -hmm. What happened? You know, what tell us about the old farm that used there, where it used to be there, or there didn't there used to be some, yeah, perhaps there's some really cool uh, geological feature that's there. Right. Well, let's go and check it out. So that gives us a reason for the journey rather than we're going hiking, uh, just for the sake of going hiking. So I would bring in that kind of curiosity, but I get them to choose what they wanted to do. Mm -hmm. and then we'd have to, to plan and undertake the route to go there. But because it's going to be sort of in in the the uh, the the neighborhood of or the close by to where we are in a in a in it's in a not a wilderness context but like almost a peri urban context, I, I can give them a lot of uh, they can have a lot of power they can have a lot of agency to choose how they're going to get there how and and, and so on and that to plan their trip. And it's not the end of the world if they don't have, you know, a, a, a really fancy waterproof jacket because uh, they, they, they might have, um, so they might get wet f for a little bit if it rains, but it won't be the end of the world. So I think giving, I think having these kind of closer to home, less sexy adventures are actually have the capacity to be much more adventurous in terms of their, their, uh, their kind of their transfer to everyday life. I mean, there doesn't even need to be a transfer because it is their everyday life, right? And uh, yeah. and uh, so they have a lot of power. They have uh, they can make a lot of decisions. Um, but also, if if uh, it, we can allow for some uncertainty, to you know, if they were going way off the route, I wouldn't necessarily have to step in. Let's 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 get lost. Let's let it get dark for a bit. But if we were on a ski tour, if we were, if we were uh, canoeing down a river, I, you know, I guess we wouldn't get we wouldn't get too lost on a river. <laughs> but if we were on a, a canoe yeah. tour, a, a ski tour, or something, uh, um, yeah. you know, I'd be stepping in to say, "Hey, look, we need to we need we're going the wrong way. We need to get to where we're going before it's dark, so we because people are cold or what have you." And and if, if it was on a river, for example, the the equivalent would be, um, yeah, just really having to take much more of a uh, controlling the uh, the the activity to such a great degree because students don't yet have the mastery to undertake that yeah. journey on their own. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask about the role of uh, role of the teacher so you kind of mentioned that if people are getting cold and you you've got lost when you're skiing then that's probably the time when you interfere. But in general, what I hear is more that you you let the students to decide how they want to get to that place where you're going, and would you allow them to do some mistakes as well if 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 that's not the danger for anyone to get lost a bit? Then yeah, and so absolutely, yeah. and and I think that's why that's what I love about uh, education in general, but particularly outdoor education is, is, I mean, I'm just constantly thinking when I'm out with the group, you know, at what point do I step in? Do I, do I, you know, at what, at what point does this, does this start to become, as Dewey would say, a miseducative, uh, you know, so do I let them get lost a little bit 
and kind of mm-hmm. have that experience. And then, but equally, then I don't want to take away from their experience by rescuing them unnecessarily by coming and say, "Oh, let me show you on the map where we are, and now yeah. I can rescue you." And but to, so, yeah. so 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 I think it is important to 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 let people have certain feelings of uh, of of being not quite sure where they are, but then also being able to to solve that, to 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 fix that on their own and if, and I think that the the skill with the outdoor educator and I guess I, and I shouldn't say just outdoor educator with any educator is is knowing the group that you're with and how far they can be pushed and uh, so knowing thinking that right okay well I'm with a bunch of eight-year-olds and they're cold and they're scared so I'm not going to say I don't know where we are and uh, we're going to stay out a little bit longer and you're going to have to figure this out and toughen up. Well, that, that yeah. may not be a very good strategy, but if we're mm. uh, working with a bunch of uh, uh, aspirant uh, mountain leaders, uh, we might think, no, okay, look, look, let's see if we can solve this. And, uh, and you're going to be a little bit hungry, a little bit cold, and a little bit wet, but we'll be out for another hour or so. And let's see if we can get, get ourselves back on the trail. For example, hmm. so I think we yeah. we're really uh, outdoor educators and are always wrestling with that kind of what what is the right amount of challenge. I I think that's really quite fascinating. My question would be in this when we are talking about education in in this age of measurement and and when things are quantified and things are constantly assessed, how do you work with the learning outcomes it's quite difficult to pinpoint like what exactly has been learned and and how is it assessed and are you do you have to be constantly justifying what's what's the value of doing this yeah well i think frankly i people like me have it a lot easier than teachers who are working in schools and i really feel for teachers who are working within um assessment protocols and Uh, curriculum that is really uh, prescribed and they don't have a lot of freedom to 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 stray outside of those lines uh, i really feel for uh, teachers yeah like that yeah well from what 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 i have what teachers because i'm i guess i'm using teachers more because i think at outdoor centers where there generally isn't too much assessment Uh, yeah. on expeditions or on residential visits um, but it, if if it's working w- w- when there's curriculum involved let's say let's ha- f- as a kind of a blanket way a uh, broad way of looking at this if there's curriculum involved and assessment is involved what i th- i think is is important is that the learning outcomes th- those remain the same whether it's indoors or outdoors or a bit of both It is, uh, but the if when working outdoors or when working adventurously, if you like, there may be a certain amount of kind of retrospective joining, a linking of those experiences that are happening on the course or in the class and those learning outcomes. So it doesn't, and I've seen some teachers who have worked. Uh, been working outdoors do this well where they have a lesson plan and they say oh these are my two or three learning outcomes for this lesson but then after the lesson they go back to the lesson plan and say ah but we also hit these two other uh learning outcomes that i hadn't even intended to hit but we definitely got there because uh the the class uh and the it was open enough to uh to kind of going in its own direction what i mean like the class time the actual uh, uh time that the class had together was not so prescriptive that it was able to kind of uh follow the interests of the student or or perhaps just as importantly to respond to uh whatever is happening in the world around them so imagine that a class was in a in a in a park And they saw uh, a bird of prey, uh, and 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 then and it was quite close by, and people could see what it was doing. 
But imagine if a teacher said, well, that wasn't, we weren't supposed to learn about birds of prey today. So that's not really, that doesn't really count. <laughs> you know, that would be, that would be absurd. And similarly, if, if, uh, if it was an urban trip to, uh, uh, and the class was going to the museum or to the city hall, and there was something else very interesting that was happening. Like there was a, uh, there were some workers who were on strike and they had megaphones and they were saying, you know, we demand the better pay or, you know, better conditions and so on. And, and so how could a teacher ignore something like that if they were uh, out with a group? So what's my point of this long ramble? My point is that, sure, as educators, we will go out with our intended learning outcomes, but we really need to be open uh, to responding to the places we're in. Uh, you know, like that, uh, watch Alan Brown talk about, you know, a pedagogy of place. And so we need to be, all, all of our places are, that, that we uh, are in, have our cross-curricular. So we need to be um, uh, making links between those places and the learning outcomes. So I think that's the way around if people are uh, have very fixed learning outcomes, and and in, and I think it's right to have fixed learning outcomes uh, uh, up to a point, you know. Otherwise, that the, there, you know, the the the, uh, the education systems would would just be a, it would be a joke. There need to be there need there need to be these structures. But I think what we need yeah. teachers need to have more power. Talk about agency, you know, uh, just like the students. Teachers need to have more power to be able to uh, make connections between what is being learned uh, and and those learning outcomes that and and to do those in ways that mean that they can kind of step outside of the the confines of a, of, of a, an overly packaged uh, kind of systematized way of uh, learning uh, predetermined uh, yeah. chunk, chunks of knowledge. When you talk about these kind of unexpected encounters and and then surely these are learning experiences as well, it it just reminds me of uh, Gunnar Breivik, some of his recent work and how he talked in this podcast earlier about sport as a, a way of exploring and experimenting with the world and how different kinds of worlds are disclosed to us or open up to us when we when we go out there and explore. So. It was just kind of a link to what he was he was talking about earlier. Yeah, and I think that's that's a really good link too because I mean when we think of it, how, I mean how it has not been the idea of putting children inside buildings as a way to prepare them for a life uh, when they get older is uh, is incredible when you think of it. It's not been going on in the world for very long in mm. terms of human history but this is what we do now right <laughs> you know, you, yeah you, mm -hmm. you've got the little yeah. child and we send them away and then they're and then the longer they spend inside that building called school the less and less time they spend outdoors the less and less choice they have and the more and more they have to pass these uh, exams that have been developed by uh, the state that will determine uh, their futures in terms of what they do for uh, a, a livelihood so yeah let's get let's we've gotta we've gotta kind of reclaim the not the outdoors in terms of what we were talking about earlier like oh we've got to get everybody back in the forest but i think we've got to get our young people outdoors in the real world experiencing like i think we've got to base our root our educate more of our educational practices in the real world yeah i've enjoyed this discussion so much so a lot of ideas to explore further just kind of to wrap up and and i would really love to finish with some philosophizing on adventures <laughs> kind of what are what are your thoughts on i mean we are talking about uh good life and and meaningful life and and finding meaning in your in your activities whether they are outdoors or indoors but so yeah, what are why is adventure relevant for living a good life and 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 why is it relevant for living a meaningful life as well? Hmm. Adventure can be important for leading a, a good life and a valuable life 
if it makes us feel good about who we are, if it makes us, uh, I think there are opportunities through adventures to have very positive interactions with other human beings and to have uh, feel a sense of connection to place, whether it's the, the heritage of a place or it is the more the the, the ecology uh, of a place. So I think it's it's that um, it's a deepening of uh, the, the feelings we have uh, about ourselves, and and that also that connection to to landscapes, uh, for example. And it might, and 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 often, it, if you're unless if you're doing that alone, then it, it can be perhaps more more spiritual, I suppose some might say. But also think adventures. I've had some of my most powerful discussions uh, and kind of uh, interdependent relationships with groups of people when I've been in wilder places outdoors. So I, yeah, from from me that that those are the reasons, but it may be, of course, that uh, people. It's not to say that everybody needs to uh, go for a long walk in the woods every day. Although increasingly, researchers say that's a really good idea for your mental health. But in mm. terms of some kind of uh, um, feeling good about oneself and feelings of mastery and at peace with oneself. You know, people might get those through uh, any other kind of pursuit. You know, it might be that the way that you really kind of uh, feel a certain sense of authenticity and, uh, um, and happiness is through baking a cake or by, um, playing the piano, for mm. example. So I feel like I need to, to kind of temper any claims I make about what adventure can do for one's, uh, uh, in terms of one's ability to, to, to find meaning uh, and so on, uh, because that's just what I like. But there, there, there will be, mm. uh, it's just one way. And I think that, that uh, other people will have perhaps different ways of, um, finding that that elusive meaning uh, in life and uh, and uh, sort of contentment that so many of us are seeking i i think those are really wonderful closing words for for the episode so i really really enjoyed our talk so thank you so much for uh, insp- inspirational and yeah, a lot to think about. Thanks for the talk. So. Oh, it was such a pleasure. I, I hope there wasn't too much waffling, I, but uh, it's amazing how quickly the time goes when, when we're, we're getting into these uh, bigger questions. Uh, so thanks so much for inviting me to be part of the show. Thanks for joining us this week on Physical Activity Research Through Podcast. If you like the show, make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing or following the show on Twitter. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. Thank you for your support. If you found value in the show, we would really appreciate a rating on Apple Podcasts or whichever app you use. Or if you would, in a real old school way, simply tell a friend about the show, it would be great help for us we have a fantastic lineup of guests for forthcoming episodes so be sure to tune in thank you all for your support and have a great day